Hi guys, hopefully you can all hear me fine. It's Robin Christofferson here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to this, the third episode or the third session in our Accessibility Insights series where we have brief-ish chats with the top names in accessibility and digital inclusion across the globe and absolutely uh, fitting the bill in that category is this month's guest who is Paul Smythe. He's head of digital inclusion at Barclays, one of the leading retail banks in the UK. Uh, Paul, do you want to just briefly say hi and then I'm going to do a bit of housekeeping before we get kicked off. Yeah, sure. Hey, Robin. Hi, um, hi, everyone. And yeah, w w welcome to this um, this, uh, this podcast. I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. So yeah, um, certainly it is going to be going out as a podcast as well. If people, thanks for reminding me, yeah, if people are uh, interested in getting it in podcast form, then just search for TechShare Pro. TechShare is one word. TechShare Pro. Um, and there's loads of good content in there as well. It will also be going up after the event on YouTube and other places and we'll mention those at the end. A bit of housekeeping at the beginning. So if people are needing captions then you can just tap or click the CC button I think at the bottom of your screen. You may know already or you'll certainly get the picture very quickly that I'm blind and Paul as well is visually impaired. Maybe we'll ask him about that. Um, uh, a little bit later on but yeah so um, if I've got that positioning wrong then apologies but hopefully that CC button is uh, apparent so that you can just tap on that to get closed captions coming up. We've also got them available in uh, if on screen here we've got a URL to an alternative stream of those live captions if people prefer to have that alternative format from streamtext.net and the URL's a bit too uh, difficult to read out there but by all means go there if you want to. Heather is our very capable uh, um, captioner, live captioner today so thanks Heather. There will also be the slides available after the fact, you've got the link there and similarly show notes and a transcript, a full transcript of today's conversation will go up on our website as well. So please do check out after the event if you want to catch up on exactly what we talked about. Uh, but let's get cracking. Oh, it mentions about Q&A. If you want to uh, ask a question, unfortunately, the format isn't to respond to those today, but you can certainly do so. Uh, and we will compile those and bring responses after the fact to everybody that is uh, present today on the webinar or who has registered with the webinar, but we won't be responding to those today. And we have a feedback form if people are interested in uh, providing us with some valuable feedback so we can make these sessions as enjoyable and informative as possible. Okay then, so let's go on to the next slide. Uh, Sarah is kindly driving the slides for me today. So <clears throat> Paul, welcome. Thanks mm -hmm. again for attending. And we always start these sessions by um, a very uh, impo important question. What's your poison? What hot beverage, cold beverage are you um, using to bolster yourself and get through the ordeal? Get me through lockdown. Chat? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think I, I drink a lot of tea and coffee. Um, I've just moved house a couple of weeks back and being a uh, um, being someone with diabetes who moved in a heat wave, you know, I've, I've drunk a lot of sugary drinks. Uh, <laughs> what I've got at the moment is a, um, a, a, a big glass of squash, but again, it's a vision impairment thing. It's not really a glass. It's a big bright colored beaker because uh, you know, glasses are largely a bit of an accident waiting to happen in my house. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't got like a spouty thing on top though. Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Tommy to be. no. I literally just knocked my tea about five minutes before we started recording today and I was doing a bit of mopping up. But yeah, so, yep. say la vie. Okay then. So, question number one, I just had a, a note that says Sarah stop screen share. So hopefully we still got the slides up on the screen. Um, so question number one, kick off. Barclays has obviously made a huge progress when it comes to accessibility and digital inclusion, both internally 
and externally. So can you give us an idea, <coughs> excuse me, of how you manage to pull that off? I'm thinking about the business case really internally because you know there is a certain amount of budget, maybe not um, as much as people might think, certainly not if you do it in a timely way. So how have you won the business case to, and if you want to briefly explain some of the um, advances that you've personally experienced and potentially, potentially even been responsible for okay. in recent months and years. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, thanks, Robin. And I, I guess, you know, before launching into that, you know, th thanks for the invite on to fix this with insights. Um, well, but I'm really thanks for what, what you and the team do, Robin, at AbilityNet, for just shining a light on, on the accessibility community and, you know, these webinars, which really help to, um, again, sort of get accessibility leaders to show what we're doing, to champion, to prioritise accessibility and really to act and amplify the voices of the disability community, you know, mm -hmm. more important than ever in this time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in, you know, you question it, what's the business case for accessibility? And it, it's the why question, right? So why organisations should start bothering to think about and do anything about accessibility and perhaps why organisations should continue to do more around accessibility. Um, so with me leading uh, accessibility for, for Barclays for the past 10 years, I mean, we've learned a lot over that time. I think the accessibility business case always boils down, boils down to sort of three things about the legal requirement, the commercial opportunity, the, the moral imperative. And I think often organisations that are maybe lazy and just see accessibility as something legally they have to do, I mean, mm. they really think more broadly and deeply about what it means and why it matters for them. So, mm. you know, at Barclays, the journey we've been on, we now have a, a public ambition to be the most accessible FTSE company, something we're serious and committed about, and maybe some of the things that have helped us over that, the time, again, senior leaders for our um, are really active sponsors and about creating opportunities to really meet real world disabled people and hear from them about the challenges they face to kind of remind ourselves that it's not about checkpoints that we failed but customers that we're failing when we when we get accessibility wrong you know we've also done a lot to, to think deeply about what accessibility means what matters for us for Barclays for our organization and sector and that's about making sure that all people can use our, our our banking products and services will be employed by us regardless of their abilities their situation their circumstance and making sure the digital things we build you know that it creates a positive experience for everyone and that we don't unintentionally leave out or leave behind anyone and it's really sort of powerful to again have that clear sense of, of purpose around accessibility um, you know we've seen a, a huge amount of benefits that accessibility brings from you know having um, more customers and more happier customers it's about the user experience about bolstering your brand and reputation when you get it right about mitigating the legal compliance financial reputation risks of, of getting it wrong and doing nothing mm -hmm. and really how when you lean into accessibility inclusive design it it sort of leads to a more diverse workforce a more creative and um and, and productive workforce um you know not to mention it's, it's good good for business so i think over the time we've always been trying to shift for why we do accessibility less about the legal have to do and more about the commercial and moral want to do and I think when I step back more broadly and think about you know the work I do works within the bank as a disability um, sector champion for the, the government or for the um, work co-chairing with the business disability forum I've kind of seen over the last decade this trend of these sort of three um, pillars for organizations have gone through on, on, on their accessibility journey I think a decade ago accessibility experts you know we're looking at we need to build a website that's, that's compliant for the disabled and it was broadly that it was a checkbox sort of exercise and i think as time passed and folks realized that it's better to kind of involve and include disabled people but nothing about us without us and creating things you know products by for and with disabled people it shifted from not just a, a website say being compliant um, for disabled but designed for the disabled and i think in the last five years there's been a real wake up in um you know uh, collective consciousness around inclusive design and that accessible design doesn't just benefit disabled people but everyone we're all situationally or temporally impaired from time to time so it's not just you know building websites that's compliant for the disabled it's um, designed for the disabled but designed for difference for all of us and i think that's been a really more. important yeah, you know narrative yeah but we've certainly tried to tell um and, it, and it's kind of frustrating sometimes when you still have these you know 
conversations about business case. I, I know we share a lot um, online and publicly about some of the, um, you know, in, in number terms for sort of proof points when we get accessibility right, when we think about it deliberately from the start. Um, and we've, we've really swept this all together into a, um, a guide because we have this conversation when we're trying to engage and educate and influence our suppliers, for example. So again, I'll make sure we can um, link to it in some of the show notes, Robin, but our um, um, su supply guide for accessibility really tries to tell our narrative and story about why accessibility matters for us. So, so I, I think hopefully that, that's the kind of the business case. I, I think you mentioned for folks maybe that might not be familiar, just real quick on some of the accessible support and services that you know Barclays is, is known for around accessibility. You know, from um, talking cash machines for folks with um, sites or, or print difficulties, or maybe English not your first language, um, high visibility debit cards, um, sign language interpreter services, be that remotely on your computer or in bank branches, um, you know, really creating um, uh, contactless wearables to help people with dexterity difficulties, uh, gambling blocks for people impacted by mental health or gambling addictions, and really for folks with um, you know, cognitive challenges, learning difficulties, really looking at how we can make security steps and biometrics really simple, or how we can simplify down and, and, and present information about people's, um, you know, people's transactions that they're having on, on their bank accounts to really help everyone understand and make the most of their money. So these are sort of a handful of some of the you know, accessible support services, the, the kind of firsts that you know, Barclays has done really trying to help disabled and older vulnerable people, um, you know, pre-COVID, and these things are really important and build on sort of, you know, now, now we're in a, a COVID, a very different world. Yeah, and I think that you have personally overseen in your tenure at uh, Barclays, most, if not all of those changes, and there really is, I mean, you've mentioned them, or many of them, um, a range of firsts that Barclays has put, you know, led in the, um, retail banking sector. Uh, we had a, a question from the Twitterverse actually, you know, we put out questions, uh, a, a call for questions in advance of these sessions. And Christy actually said that, you know, she doesn't currently bank with Barclays, she's with another bank. And she talks about how the dark green uh, color of her banking cards are problematic for her with her vision impairment. So I think you highlighted there or um, mentioned about high vis debit card. Um, that's just an, one of the examples of where, you know, they, Barclays really do stand out or at least led the way uh, in those areas. I should also mention, I didn't mention it at the beginning, that um, as a result of, you know, the great uh, steps and uh, achievements that you've made in Barclays and your activities that you talked about um, in the public sector and in the BDF, uh, you know, you were honoured with an MBE um, for your <laughs> services to digital inclusion. So yeah, absolutely brilliant job. Just sort of needed to throw that in there in case people weren't aware. Should have mentioned it at the beginning, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, you mentioned COVID. Um, so, and you've talked about not just your customers, but you talked about your staff as well. And I think that can sometimes, you know, when it's a customer facing, you know, it's an organisation that's delivering services to the public. Um, sometimes the, the internal questions can be, um, deprioritized a little bit but yeah how, what about COVID then and how has that impacted your both your employees and your customers um, anything kind of new with a new focus or new imperative since <laughs> the beginning of COVID yeah I mean wow I mean there's quite quite, quite a lot um, that we have done in a short space of time um, and, and, and again maybe just um, just following up on, on the high, high vis debit cards. I know um, for f folks, if they are interested, I think all, all the accessible services we have, you can find it more at barclays.co.uk slash accessibility. Again, high vis debit cards, we have, I think a dozen different colors, bright arrows, um, high contrasting details and, and bigger um, security codes on the back. And again, you know, these were the brainchild of our disabled staff network, which is why, you know, disabled staff kind of act as rocket fuel to the accessibility agenda okay. of, of many organizations and, and we've really seen that um, but you know covid so huge amount of change and challenge at the moment um, you'd be familiar with some of the mainstream media and, and the, the standard stuff that all banks have done responding so you know waving over our fees um, repayment holidays for mortgages uh, business banks back loans so i'm not going to touch on any of that i think 
what we've seen is, is some, you know, huge amount of nuanced um, challenges that many disabled, older, vulnerable customers um, that we really think about and, and support have, have faced in, in COVID. Um, and, and I guess to, to give you some ideas, I mean, it was really important for us as a bank to proactively reach out to customers that we already know in terms of uh, having disability or vulnerability and letting them know about some of the extra support and services available. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all kind of held our breath quite literally when COVID happened and tightened our belts in terms of spending, uh, in terms of how we bank, going to a bank branch, uh, you know, has, has reduced dramatically. Um, making payments by cash has reduced dramatically. Mm -hmm. So there's been real shift in behaviours. And again, it's important for many customers, maybe old customers, for example, that might have relied on bank branches to make them aware of and prioritise them in how they're having to, um, you know, adjust to how they do their banking. So, you know, again, that's proactively communicating with them. It's about making sure that um, customers that would use bank branches when they use telephone banking, for example, that they are prioritised and fast tracked in the queues along with NHS workers really important for us to have a single telephone number rather than mm -hmm. any special accessibility helpline, you know, that's buried on a website, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to really prioritize and, 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 and respond to those customers. I think we also need to think about, you know, the million and a half or so folks um, deemed, you know, vulnerable uh, by the government and shielding and some of their nuanced needs when they're reliant on, you know, friends and family, neighbors and carers to do shopping on their behalf. And I think we've responded here by, again, um, issuing um, hundreds of sort of wearable contactless devices so that um, someone shielding can, can get one of these um, con contactless wearables. They can top it up with their bank balance. They can give it to a neighbour to pop down uh, the shops and, and do shopping on their behalf. So the kind of high tech solution for folk shielding. We've also, um, again, offered services to uh, deliver cash to the doorstep of people shielding if they're, again, needing a sort of a lower tech solution, they're reliant on cash to budget, to give to carers to shop on their behalf. So again, there's all these um, challenges that came up as a consequence of COVID that we're really responding to. I think we've also seen millions, you know, millions of customers already use our online banking website, our mobile banking app. We now have millions more customers that use, um, you know, the app and the website, services like uh, check imaging, being able to take mm -hmm. a picture of your paper check and process and pay it, you know, has, has gone up massively and has been a real time saver and life saver for folks. And instead of going to a, you know, a bank branch, for example, being able to do things independently. But for many of those customers that are quite new to digital and being forced to do it, you know, it's great that we have our main website and app, you know, our um, accessible, they're accessibility accredited by AbilityNet. You know, we're mm -hmm. serious and committed about that. We go to great pains to make sure they're technically accessible and we do disabled user testing to give, you know, a great experience for a greater number of people. But we also need to think about, you know, providing simpler guides to people that are quite new to digital on how to use um, and get the most out of those digital services. Um, you know, I think ATMs have also been improved in, in recent weeks. We've made sure that some of our newer kiosks that do more features have more accessibility settings built into them so that they talk more for more of, of the journeys if you're checking your balance, if you're getting cash out, if you're depositing cash in. Um, you know, so you get the sense there's, there's quite a, a, a few things that have really been rushed out to respond to this, you know, to meet this moment. And maybe, you know, when I wrap up on the customer side, I kind of always thought that, you know, accessible customer service comes down to three things, right? Around offering flexibility, choice and personalization. And I think now in, in this kind of COVID crisis, there's maybe two more things that are important for, for, for brands to respond to. And it's about, you know, being responsive and being responsible. So, you know, for Barclays as a large organization, being responsible is about really helping support the customers and communities you operate with them. Um, and, you know, being responsive is, is really, you know, a number of the examples I've, I've kind of touched on to really help make sure that we're there, you know, with our customers when they're, they're going through difficult times um, and again, making sure they can do their banking kind of how, where, and when they want. Um, so, so, so that's kind of on, on the customer side. Um, just real quick, thinking about on the staff side, you know, what have we seen in, in recent weeks and months? 
And I think, you know, Barclays, we have about 80,000 members of staff who all, you know, work uh, from home overnight, many call centre agents, many investment bank traders, that this has, you know, never been done before, um, you know, and by and large, very smooth transition. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we, there's been, you know, niggles, you know, we use super secure um, software tools. We were just talking about um, earlier, Robin, and I think working from home, the different software that we have has, has meant that Barclays, you know, we're accelerating our move to more modern, more accessible um, productivity tools like Microsoft Teams, you know, Microsoft mm. and you've had Jenny Lay fly on doing some incredible things around accessibility and mainstreaming in their products. Um, and I think we're all kind of coming to terms with working remotely, how we manage effectively, how we um, maybe run accessible virtual meetings where everyone's voice is heard and can contribute. Um, and, you know, how, how, we, how we brainstorm and debate, you know, when we're working remotely. And I think, you know, we're still figuring out the best way to do this. Lots of guidance that we're writing as an accessibility team to help support the wider um, workforce. Um, I think that, you know, our colleagues with disabilities too, you know, have, um, have also had their own challenges in, in terms of lockdown. I think as lockdown started, we were quick to either duplicate some of the adjustments and equipment they had in the, in the workplace to their home offices, um, you know, or, or, or move at home. I think we've seen as, as lockdown's gone on, this almost tenfold increase in other members of staff reaching out and asking for adjustments. And I think what's driven this, right, is we know that many people don't have the home set up, the office, you know, they're working on a bed, a sofa, an ironing board. And doing that for, you know, a day or two is okay, but doing it for several weeks isn't. Yeah. And it can kind of create more posture and musculoskeletal problems. So again, we've been, um, you know, quick to put in place campaigns where we can um, issue out at scale, whether it's, you know, monitors, ergonomic chairs and so forth, to really meet the needs of, you know, people working from home, um, you know, not just for days, but, you know, for, for weeks and months now. So there's been some, you know, interesting sort of challenges and trends really around adjustments. Um, I think mental health, we see in the mainstream media about, you know, depression doubling and about, you know, we've been investing in um, colleague wellness programs and really proactive and preventative measures around, um, you know, um, mental health and mental resilience. And I guess the kind of final thought on, on the staff side is, you know, we're doing a lot of Barclays to make sure we hear the diverse voices of everyone on, you know, when we go back to work, different people have different views of how quickly they want to go back to the office and how the office is going to be a different place because mm -hmm. we're not going to go back to the world we were in. And I think it's really important. I see this for several organizations externally that, you know, we shouldn't be having senior leaders, you know, who sit in their spacious smart home offices the kind of privileged minority, so to speak, making decisions on the future of work, the future of home working, the future of offices and how they're going to change to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, collaborative meeting spaces. Um, you know, does that mean there's no desks in there? Does that mean wheelchair users can get in, around, in and around, for example? So it's really important that we, we kind of amplify the voices of the disability community um, in particular, as well as, you know, people of a whole, whole wide range of backgrounds um, to make sure we're going in eyes wide open to, to review, you know, the ways we're going to be working from home and the tools that everybody needs to succeed, as well as how the offices, you know, of the future are also going to be slightly different from what we have now. Um, so hopefully it gives you, you know, a sort of a sense of some of the, the things we've done on the customer side, the trends and, and the kind of challenges looking forwards that we see in, in terms of staff and workforce to us and many other um, organisations out there. That is brilliant. It sounds like, I mean, no, nothing about us without us. It sounds like you're really <laughs> taking the input from both your customers and your employees um, at the very heart of you know, decisions that you're making going forward. And we see this time and again, organizations where their internal employee group, um, feedback from customers, etc., when it comes to accessibility or inclusion, haven't been sufficiently prioritized. And then suddenly with everyone needing to work from home or to be more flexible in their working, um, suddenly that is something that they're having to provide for everyone and lo and behold the people that have been calling for more flexibility and more options in this area have been accommodated uh, albeit on a kind of a hasty basis that as you were saying you know with this very long tail of, of um, COVID that we're that we're seeing you know we're going to be in this for the longer term so 
like you say, those hasty um, workstation setups or decisions about what software to rapidly implement is, uh, you know, hopefully not having to be rethought, but certainly, you know, inclusion is, this is the right time to help prioritize that. So looking at the future then, um, where do you see the accessibility, you know, accessible banking heading in coming years? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's hard to think, Robin, I don't know if you can remember this far back, but there was a time that to do our banking, we needed to get, you know, change out of our pyjamas, put on trousers and, and go somewhere, <laughs> right? And, and I think it's, um, you know, it's fair to say that, you know, digital banking is, you know, has accelerated. I think, um, you know, bank branches and, and cash is, is reducing maybe far quicker than it, it ever was. Still important we have that choice and flexibility. Um, I think we're going to continue to see, you know, this trend of, of mobile banking um, being really popular by everyone that uses it, a kind of simpler experience on a smaller smartphone screen, AI powering whether it's chatbots or being able to better visualize and categorize and understand your money. Um, you know, so, so there's an, an, a number of improvements on, on, on the banking side of the fence. I think in terms of the profession though, maybe there's some, some bigger challenges that's worth kind of just calling out now, because you know, the accessibility profession um, and community, you know, we, we've been heavily involved over the last decade of professionalizing it, of being founding members of International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And I think we're at this kind of important point now, because I think maybe a decade ago, you could be a, a technical expert, you could audit, you know, websites, and, and that was it, sort of knowing how to code for accessibility. But I think to meet this moment now where digital is seen as the silver bullet and there's a real risk right that there's so the pace of digital happening that we don't want to you know make sure that accessibility is, is kind of deprioritized or is forgotten in, in many other organizations out there and I think to meet this moment it requires something else of accessibility professionals um, and, and, and again it's not just having the technical skills but the business and people skills um, maybe, you know, let, let, have I ever told you the story about the, the free bricklayers? No. No? Okay. Well, well let's say, you know, there, there's free bricklayers, right? And I'm walking along and I, and I go to the first bricklayer, you know, what are you doing? They say, okay, I'm, 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 building, a, I'm building a wall. I say, okay. So I go to the next bricklayer and say, what, what are you doing? They say, okay, well, I'm building a house. And when I go to the third bricklayer and say, well, what, what are you doing? And they say, you know, well, I'm, I'm building a cathedral. You know, I'm making dreams come true, building someone's dream home. And when you think about this, you know, the three folks, workers, they're doing the same thing, but their pride and passion in what they do and their sense of purpose, um, that broader perspective is what's different. You know, first bricklayer, it was a job, you know, just to pay mm -hmm. the bills. Second one, it was a career, something to be advanced. And the third bricklayer, it was kind of a calling. And when yeah. I think about accessibility professionals, we need to kind of make sure that we do more evangelism, not just about how to build things accessibly, mm -hmm. but, but why? And I sort of think about that sort of silly story, right? What that would be if I, if I went along and spoke to the, you know, three different accessibility professionals, Robin. And I guess, you know, the first accessibility professional, when I say, what are you doing? They'd, they'd probably tell me the answer from, you know, a few years back of, you know, Paul, I'm building a, you know, compliant website so that my company yeah. not sued. I think, okay, well, you know, that's a start. You know, you're doing it because you legally have to. I'll go to the second accessibility professional and say, what are you doing? And, and they'll probably tell me, you know, Paul, I'm not just building a compliant website, I'm building an accessible website, you know, a great experience for a great number of people. I'd sort of feel like, okay, well, great. You know, we've, um, there's clearly a kind of a business benefit here about UX, you know, about, about doing it for the right reasons. Um, so that's good. And I'd sort of think about what it would take about what the third accessibility professional would say, right? And it would probably be, you know, not just on building a compliant website or an accessible website, you know, but Paul, I'm building an accessible world. You know, I'm making sure that you know people can go as far as their talents take them. That you know, we remove barriers, we improve lives, we unlock human potential, and we teach and we preach this story so that everybody knows and understands, truly understands accessibility, and that we all kind of collectively contribute to making it reality. Not just people with accessibility in their job title. And I sort of think what it would be like to live in a world like that. You know, it'd be it'd be far different from today. And I think that's why it's so important that as accessibility professionals, we need to make sure that, again, we've got those people and business skills to evangelize and influence others because we can't do this in a bubble by ourselves, you know, with the, the disability community, the accessibility community sort of as, as a separate bubble. So really important to, again, make sure that we're all, um, you know, amplifying and evangelizing accessibility. And we've run out of time. And that was such oh. a brilliant note to end on, although I'm very quickly going to... Um, 
So we had Neil uh, on last week, uh, last month, Neil uh, Millican of Atos, and uh, we asked him what he would say to you. And apart from saying what a brilliant guy you are and the work that you're doing, he exactly said that. He said everything should be brought together. We shouldn't try and do this alone. It should be a big tent and everyone should collaborate to try and build that that future because you know we we all have something to share so i mean by all means comment on that but i think you already have um yep bryn anderson is our next guest next month and he was uh formerly of sight improve mm-hmm. now with sainsbury's is there anything f- you know above and beyond what you kind of uh, finished up with a moment ago that you would like to pass on to Bryn for him to comment or answer next month. Sure. Yeah, so over and above that, the power of partnerships. I think the only advice or plea I'd have for uh, for Bryn, um, which again, you know, great great guy and great to use at Sainsbury's is, is really this point about how accessibility leaders, we can all help to democratise accessibility know-how and to make it as easy as possible for people to understand, to get mm-hmm. informed and involved, and, you know, and really to join the accessibility community. So that democratizing accessibility know-how is really my, my big, big piece of advice or, or plea to others. Fantastic. Brilliant. We will pass that on. Paul, thank you so much. Really, we're going to have to get you back on, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much indeed. Tiny bit of housekeeping, guys. Uh, so l- just a brief couple of slides. Um, Training, there's lots of training coming up, guys, um, covering different roles. If any of the stuff that's on screen there uh, looks interesting to you, then courtesy of um, our relationship and our, um, as a, you know, to honor Barclays being our um, guest this month, 10 Barclays is the code. That's all one word, capital B, one zero Barclays. If you use that code, then you can get a discount on the training that you can see there. And then on the final slide, we have all the ways that you can keep in touch and up to date. We've got a newsletter, we've got a YouTube channel, we've got a million different ways that you can uh, keep in touch with us. And we also have the podcast and uh, you know, you can follow that if you want to get an audio version of this or or check it out on YouTube. If you want to re-listen to, it's been a whistle stop tour this morning or this afternoon. So yeah, you may well want to have a listen back or get your friends to have a look. Uh, Paul, thanks again. Brilliant job. We will get you back on at some point. Everybody, thank you very much for attending. Sorry we overran, but I hope you agree it was well worth it. Thanks guys. See you next month.